right, guys. Good evening again. This is Venkat from Coastal Impact. Uh, we're very happy to bring you this webinar on turtles, which is a favorite underwater animal for most people. And presenting it is uh, Murli. Murli is uh, currently the field director of, for Dakshin Foundation, which is an NGO based in Bangalore. And he's involved in ideating and strategizing programs on marine flagship species including fundraising, hiring, staff hiring, and project execution. His work mainly focuses on sea turtles and other marine flagship species, which includes sea snakes and sharks along the Indian coast and their interaction with fisheries. Uh, you can imagine his plate is quite full all the time. Research includes topics related to population dynamics, genetics, trophic ecology, using these varied study systems. His main interest is in turtle biology though, and marine conservation, fisheries, wildlife interactions, and models of community-based conservation. He's an experienced field ecologist who focuses largely on coastal and marine systems in the Indian subcontinent. He has also held the following positions in the past, which is regional chair for Northern Indian Marine Turtle Talk for, uh, Task Force, uh, which is which comes under UNEP and uh, he was managing director for the Indian Ocean Turtle Newsletter and also country member for the Marine Turtle Specialist Group which comes under IUCN Species uh, Specialist Commission. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for this opportunity to uh, uh, talk to everybody about sea turtles uh, on World Sea Turtle Day. Uh, so I'll be sharing a presentation that I have uh, and can collect the questions towards the end as Venkat mentioned and then I'm happy to talk more about them. So yeah, sea turtles are amazing animals. Uh, there are seven turtle species and this chart kind of shows you how big or small they are in comparison to people. A uh, life-size uh, version of this has been placed in places in uh, one hour and at I roll in Mumbai. Yeah, so sea turtles have been around for over 180 million years and they're largely found in tropical waters and some subtropical waters all across the world's ocean. And as their names uh, say, they depend only on for reproduction, that is laying their eggs. Otherwise, they live entirely out at sea. Uh, even though they've in the water for most of their life. Uh, they can't breathe water and uh, they have to come up uh, to the surface to breathe. So they're air breathing reptiles and adapted specifically for uh, living in the sea with, and their limbs have become paddle shaped. And uh, one of the biggest differences between sea turtles and all the other turtles and tortoises that you find is that uh, their limbs and their head is non-retractable and go into their shell like other uh, and tortoises. One common feature for all species, that is the seven species of sea turtles, their life cycle, they reproduce and mate in the offshore waters in the world, and the female turtles alone come ashore to nest. This is the only time turtles come ashore to nest, come on land, and uh, after about a period of 45 to 70 days, being on the species and the temperatures, uh, the hatchlings emerge, the baby turtles emerge, and then they crawl back in sea by themselves. Uh, normally, it is during the night time, and they use uh, the vision of the moon and starlight uh, on the seawater to guide themselves. Uh, so strong light attracts these hatchling turtles, and they get oriented in many urban places close to where And when they are hatched uh, to an they develop into adults. They live a completely oceanic lives. Uh, and this phase is very commonly known as uh, the lost. Uh, uh, during the lost years, it's a phase where we don't really know what happens to most of these uh, turtles. And um, yeah, so they largely passively migrate using ocean currents. And uh, they go to feeding grounds and pour until they become large enough. Uh, uh, adults and they migrate back to those nesting sites where they were born. And the period when we 
interact mostly with turtles. Like most interactions that people uh, who've been studying turtles, conserving turtles, and uh, research on turtles uh, get to access them when they come ashore to nest. Uh, so this is from Marissa. Mostly sea turtles come to end post. Uh, sometimes comes to nest during the daytime during mass nesting in our Aribadas. Once these females come ashore, they use the adult like uh, limbs, which are adapted in swimming, but they use them to scoop out uh, a body bit in which the female turtle sits and this, this pot shaped nest where it is anywhere between 80 to 150 again, depending on the species and the size. For all of it, these, uh, the eggs are like a ping pong ball shape and the leatherback, which is the largest, uh, it would be about the size of a cricket ball. The different species of sea turtles that are there in the world, the leatherback uh, is the largest of all. A sea turtle falls the leather because unlike all the other species, uh, it doesn't have a hard shell and it has a leathery covering and dermals on the back. Then you have the green, which is very the turtle and the most commonly featured turtle in most conservation groups. Uh, it's largely a misnomer. Even this photo, which is taken underwater, it looks green in color, but uh, the turtle itself is not uh, greenish in color. It's largely brownish. Uh, it's called the green turtle because uh, it, it was very popularly consumed uh, in the past, including for the soups and the and the and the fat underneath its skin is greenish in color. So that that's why it derived the name the green turtle. Uh, and this largely because of its diet where it consumes mostly uh, sea grasses and algae, and it's almost completely herbivorous as an adult. Like the name suggests, it has a large and bulky head and a very strong beak-like mouth, uh, which it used for its feeding on bottom-dwelling animals like crustaceans. The hawks will, again, named uh, because of the way it looks. It's got a hawk-like beak. Uh, largely resident in reef systems where it uh, primarily forages on sponges and soft pups. <clears throat> and again, you have a sea turtle, which is named after the way it looks, the flat back, which is more fur in shape, uh, dorsally in compared to other species. And then you have the two uh, cousin species, the Ridley, which is endemic to Mexico, um, and the olive ridley. The olive ridley grows to about 60 to 80 centimeters in size, uh, weighs approximately 35 kilos, and it's largely uh, a carnivore, uh, feeding on fruits, uh, fishes, different crustaceans, and occasionally jellyfish. It's mostly bottom dwelling, bottom forage species. It's an ocean species, which, uh, which means it spends most of it in the open ocean. Uh, and not near reasons like the loggerhead and the green turtle. Nest about one to two times in a season. From about 120 eggs per, clutch per nest. And on average, uh, it takes about 45 days for the eggs to ingrate and hatch. Uh, but this is dependent on the external temperatures as well. We have had occasions where it can go up to 60 days, 65 days, and the temperatures are lower. Uh, once it, a female is nested for a season, it only takes about two years for it to back to its foraging ground and come back to nest. And that's known as the nesting interval between species. So the other releases are quite widespread. They're so species, so restricted to the tropics. Uh, in India, they nest almost across any sandy beach, including major metro cities like uh, Chennai, which has had uh, an active sea turtle conservation program since the late 80s. Uh, there have been recent reports of uh, nesting in Bombay as well, uh, in Varsova, but this has been reported in the past. So it's a generalist species, a uh, uh, wide sandy beach, mostly close to estuaries or river mouths is what's preferred by the olive ridley. <clears throat> and one thing which is the most striking feature of the olive ridley species is this phenomenon called the aribada, uh, which is a Spanish term for arrival, where Hundreds and thousands of turtles come uh, next continuously over the same period of time. Um, so this takes place in very few places across the world, in Costa Rica, Mexico, and different parts of Central America. Uh, on the Indian coast, there are two large mass nesting beaches close to Odisha. One is the Gahirmata Marine Sanctuary in the northern Odisha, 
and the other is Rushukul which is in southern Odisha where I've been working since uh, 2008. So over 100,000 females come to nest and lay their eggs over a period of in two to seven days, normally lasting about four days. Um, and once they've laid their eggs, they return back into the sea. Uh, so I'm going to take you a little bit more deeper into the kind of work that I've been doing in Odisha where you see such large aggregations. While the Ridleys do nest all across the Indian coast, the largest aggregations are seen in Odisha and the small minor mass nesting site which is seen in, uh, in the Andaman Islands in the Katwan Bay Sank, Arjuna Beach. So they, these all the Ridleys arrive to the offshore waters of Odisha in large numbers. Uh, by late November, early December, where the breeding place in the offshore waters. And we've been studying uh, these patterns in the offshore waters in boat survey. Uh, if you see these different locations from northern Odisha to southern Odisha, number eight is Rushikulia and number two is Gahidmar. So we've been conducting surveys in these different blocks uh, on boats uh, using trance to see where these turtles are. Um, so we've conducted them uh, since 2011. Uh, as expected, most of the turtles were seen in Rishupula. Uh, different years had different densities of turtles. And one in feature is that the aggregation patterns also shift from north to south in different years. So once they arrive off the coast of Odisha, they are a little further away from the coast, about two to three kilometers away. Uh, and they're, they're more spread out distribution but just before the nesting event the Aribada, they the aggregation moves in closer uh, and then the, the net that's when we file we find the cue that the mass nesting is going to be uh, the other common question is where do turtles come when they're not there in order to because the nesting finishes in between mid -Feb to mid-march uh, the turtles disappear from the offshore waters uh, so the Wildlife Institute of India uh, had conducted studies using satellite telemetry where they put transmitters of turtles uh, in different phases, one in 2000 and then later in uh, 2006 and 2008 and 9. And most of the turtles that observed were seen to migrate southward from the Odisha coast to Lanka. Uh, some of them remained in the offshore waters of Odisha and some traveled to Southeast Asia. Well, uh, so the large chunk of the nest population you see on the east coast of India for all the Ridleys uh, is restricted to the Bay of Bengal, and they don't—they're not very long distance mice. And so, while studying these turtles, uh, we've been monitoring their habitat as well. This visual is basically the the massing beach at Rishikulya, and uh, most people expect beaches to be static entities, which uh, remain the same year after. Uh, but we've been monitoring uh, these minute changes that happen in these beaches. Uh, as you can see, this is the river Rishukha, which uh, drains out into the Bay of Bengal from where the nesting beach got its name. And the beach changes drastically from year to year. So if uh, so, as you can see, uh, it's changing between 2008 to the following years, there are certain years where the beach is an island where the turtles nest, and there are years where the turtles nested throughout the beach from where it began. Sometimes they move further north. So uh, the turtles find the option to nest based on uh, the season. Uh, so declaring just certain sections of beach as turtle nesting beach uh, is kind of normal because the slide shows it these beach close. Uh, and everything from year to year. One of the things that we do to monitor success uh, of a nesting beach, so at Rushikulia and Gaidmata, there's the induction done that is uh, kept for protecting turtles is common in most of the parts of the coast. Uh, there are smaller hatcheries to protect certain nests, but large most nests hatch uh, in the wild naturally. Uh, now, how do we find out whether this is a successful nesting event is we excavate the nest to see uh, how many uh, eggs have had successfully. And Rushukulia is actually quite a fascinating place where 
almost every year you get a minimum of around 80% hatching success. So almost 80 out of 100 eggs hatch successfully close to 90% in certain years. So which means it's a very important nesting beach uh, for the olive ruby sea turtles globally. Uh, we've also been monitoring temperatures uh, over here within nests to look at the uh, depth of temperatures on the sea turtles um, because temperature is known to have an effect on growth patterns and also temperatures are known to determine the sex of sea turtles. Uh, sea turtles, uh, like humans, are not genetically determined uh, for their sex and the temperatures at which uh, these uh, eggs incubate determine their gender. So for all of these, there is the temperatures about 28 to 29 degrees. Uh, if constant temperatures are maintained during the third phase of the in incubation, more of the eggs will turn out to be female. And if it, at a lower temperature, so the eggs will turn out to be male. That's a phenomenon that's common between all sea turtle species. So warmer nests uh, give rise to female and cooler nests uh, give rise to male. Extreme warming events, there is a scare that on the sex ratios of the species. The species that uh, me and Dakshin, we've been conducting quite a bit of work on, which are the back species. So we've gone from the smallest sea turtle species to leather turtle. The leatherback uh, in India can nest only in the Andaman and Nicobar Island, though there have been records in the past of them nesting on different parts of the mainland beach. Uh, there haven't been any recent records of them nesting anywhere on mainland in India, except actually in Tamil Nadu near uh, the Rameshwaram district and certain parts of Gujarat. Uh, so most of our work has been conducted in the little Andaman Islands just south of the main Andaman Islands uh, in two nesting beaches at South Bay and West Bay. Uh, and this started after the tsunami that had happened uh, in the region and had caused massive damage to the nesting beaches in the Nicobar Group, where the largest nesting beaches for leatherbacks existed. So South Bay and West Bay were two key nesting beaches that were uh, monitored by us since 2008. Uh, and we have been studying the leatherback relations over there. The activities over there include applying external tags, as you can see here, which have specific uh, identification numbers. Uh, so these, for hard shuttles like the green turtle, it's applied on the fourth flipper and on the hind flipper. So if anybody comes across uh, a turtle anywhere with a uh, tag like this, it usually contains information about Tag this turtle and where it's come from, and this information is spread uh, through the internet or word of mouth. Uh, the other thing we do is apply the ejected to the front uh, using scanners. We can identify our product. So, this is useful about how many individuals are coming back. All of it is nest about two times in a season, but the leatherbacks have been known to nest up to 10 times. So just keeping account on number of nests on the beach doesn't give you an idea of the number of turtles that are coming. So even if you have, uh, let's say, twin nests, it could just be thinking of contributing to all these nests. So it's really important to identify which of these individuals uh, come. Uh, we do take other measurements they are, how uh, big the eggs are and temperatures all chip into the nest along uh, with the eggs when the turtle is laying there. Uh, if you don't know uh, how often you do see temperature changes. And this can be retrieved after the hatching is emerged and the bangle of the computers. And leatherback hatchlings, as you can see, uh, they have a much larger fore flipper than hind flippers. Uh, and they take about 70 days, close to days to hatch. And they head back into the sea. Uh, so we did conduct uh, telemetry studies to look at these leatherbacks as well. Now, I told you about all the reviews of the Odisha coast and where they travel. Uh, this is our from head, Dr. Karthik Shankar, the leading uh, turtle biologist from the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, we put these transmitters on the leatherback turtles uh, once they'd finished nesting. We'd like to see where these turtles nesting on these small group of islands in the Andaman and Nicobar travel to. Um, so the leatherbacks nesting in uh, the Little Man Islands 
seem to be traveling all over the Indian Ocean, unlike the olive release. Some went to the northern coast of Australia, but some reached all the way to the coast of Mozambique and Madagascar. So yeah, the Indian Ocean is their swimming pool. Nesting on one region doesn't mean that turtles are restricted to that region. Turtles are amazing long distance migrants. Uh, so they let the back turtle over here from our experience. We knew are traveling far and wide. So what role do these sea turtles get? They do have an important role in ocean ecosystems in maintaining seagrass beds and reef systems. I uh, had mentioned uh, green sea turtles largely herbivores and feeds mainly on seagrass. And the hawksbill controls sponge populations uh, in the region. And they do face a lot of this. Uh, there are direct threats and direct threats. Direct threats includes uh, pulling their eggs or adults. Uh, may be taken. Uh, this has actually reduced a fair bit over the years globally and including India. Uh, it does happen in very small pockets, uh, but hasn't reached uh, a phase where it would impact the sea turtle population itself. Uh, while it was a huge threat in the past due to increased uh, conservation activity and awareness programs done to a bunch of people and the state forest departments. Uh, this has reduced drastically from the 70s to the current day. Whereas the indirect threats like habitat loss and change are things which are going to have a much larger impact on sea turtle populations globally. Uh, smaller threats such as predated by hatchlings being really small get uh, fed upon by something as small as ghost crabs and even common house crow. Uh, but this is uh, part of the reason why the three turtles lay so many eggs, so that at least one in the several thousand successfully become an adult. Mechanized fishing and accidental capture. Um, this is one of the most common sites and most reported news items where dead animals, as sea turtles, and other marine mammals washing ashore because they were found in fishing nets or uh, had injuries caused by them. Um, one thing that I'd really like to reiterate is this is accidental and not purposeful in the case of most fishing incidents. Uh, nobody is going out fishing for turtle for consumption, uh, which is why the carcasses are thrown back. And I had mentioned it that many case turtles which have been caught in fishing nets have been known to recover. Uh, but because people, especially the fishermen, are afraid of consequences of bringing back an animal which could potentially be dead and then getting into trouble. Uh, many of these animals are thrown back to the sea where they drown. Marine pollution, especially plastics, is a huge global concern. Juvenile sea turtles uh, like to, are very curious animals and like to bite on anything that they can see and they like to consume jellyfishes as well. The little turtle almost entirely feeds only on jellyfish and plastics floating in the waters are a major concern because they are mistaken by these animals uh, to be fish and are ingested. Uh, while there is a bit on uh, how much uh, plastic affects the animals themselves, uh, there are a lot of cases with juvenile turtles that have washed ashore and necropsies have been done to show that their stumble filled with plastic balloons. Climate change, uh, again, uh, globally, uh, I had mentioned briefly about the effects of temperatures uh, on sea turtle populations. Now, increasing temperatures uh, and shift in oceanic current patterns can affect sea turtles in multiple ways. Uh, one is with regards to determination where warming uh, and why can cause uh, skew and sex ratios where more females are produced. Uh, change in ocean currents can affect their migratory patterns. Like I said, most of them have used ocean currents uh, to travel between the foraging sites and their nesting grounds, and this can cause disruptions. Uh, so this is something that should be combated uh, on a much wider uh, scale uh, through a large number of policy changes as well. And with regards to habitat modification, goes through construction, uh, resorts coming up are huge 
concerned, in my opinion, um, more than the accidentals that are caused due to fishing. Uh, with coastal construction, armoring, which you see almost all across all urban coal areas, uh, nesting beaches are completely lost. And once a, the nesting beach is lost, uh, it can cover. Uh, the armoring prevents the, the turtles to come from nesting. Uh, so coastal development plants like large scale port development uh, and armoring to protect coastal roads are a huge issue. And, uh, this is something that again needs to be tackled with good policy by identifying uh, these nesting beaches which I'd shown you earlier uh, and demarcate these areas from uh, excessive development. And this development doesn't necessarily have to be right on the nesting beach itself. A port coming a few kilometers, uh, 10 kilometers north or so south of the nesting beach can have similar effects on the beach itself. So this kind of uh, planning needs to be kept in place by make policies for development. There's a lot of information about sea turtles that you can get online. Uh, the internet is a huge source of information, but uh, our work at Dakshin also involves producing a large amount of outreach in terms of uh, posters in terms of this website called Sea Turtles of India. Uh, you can check, it's just seaturtlesofindia.org. Um, you get detailed information about all the turtle species, where they're found, nesting these uh, organizations that are working in that region, people working in that region, uh, and a treasure trove of literature that has been written on sea turtles in the region. Uh, we also host an informal blog called Talking Turtles, on the same page, which you can access uh, and send in your stories as well. For more technical information, you, we also run this newsletter called the Indian Ocean News, Turtle Newsletter. It's a biannual production uh, and you can submit your entries and read past entries as well. It's completely free, freely available online. And uh, you've also got technical manuals and posters and you do keep posting on uh, all social media platform, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and you can follow Dakshin Foundation and it. The final bit that I'd like to come to is uh, the importance of coastal communities, especially fishing communities in all the work that has been carried out. Um, while they have largely, in many cases, been put as villains causing deaths of turtles, they have actually been our closest support, both in terms of gaining knowledge about these oceans uh, as well as in a lot of conservation and protection uh, programs that happen. Uh, all the staff uh, in Odisha are from the villages uh, right next to the nesting beach and in fact they know a lot more about turtles than uh, trained sea turtle scientists uh, and we get to learn about them a lot. Uh, they have also become very active in spreading this information uh, two other villages in the par in, in the region, uh, and they are the ambassadors uh, for the conservation and research program that has happened. Uh, they have been engaged in a lot of outreach activities, rescuing sea turtles uh, and releasing them safely. Um, and this is not just one within induction. This is not just me. This is a huge, huge team of people. For the last ten years, we've had this. Wonderful, wonderful bunch of people from different organizations helping us out, uh, coordinators, um, largely with the program, and a huge bunch of field teams uh, at our different sites who actually given me a lot of uh, knowledge over the years. And the other initiative that we have is the Turtle Action Group. It's an informal network of uh, NGOs and grassroots organizations as well as researchers and uh, research institutions across the country. Uh, as I had shown in the map, sea turtles nest all across the Indian coast. And we do have independent uh, entities that, are, that have come up uh, for their protection and spreading outreach and awareness. And there's almost one member from uh, a coastal state in India. Uh, and we do meet up regularly and have a mailing list uh, where we share information uh, and we've learned from each of those experiences. Uh, so this is an initiative uh, where we share experiences and it's not just one central entity that's uh, spreading uh, information, but 
the work can be done at a large scale only through networks such as this. Finally, I'd just like to bring back uh, to notice uh, everybody who's attending uh, about a campaign that we are running. Like I said, teaching communities and families uh, have faced a lot of trouble with the COVID situation. And while sea turtle conservation and biology is my primary interest, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do this without the fish companies. And so I think the same for every con marine conservation group that started up. So this is a, a, a funding campaign that's running. So anyone interested can check it out and support the cause. Now we have a Q&A window. Uh, the first yeah. question was, uh, have there been any studies done on turtles on the West Coast and their movement pattern, especially with reference to Goa? Uh, so actually there's not been much uh, work that's been done on sea turtle movement uh, in India. The only two places that uh, the work has been done is Odisha and the Andamans. And that is by the Wildlife Institute of India and uh, IASC and Lakshan Foundation. Um, so the west coast of India, while it does receive a fair uh, bit of nesting, uh, logistic challenges are to be able to find enough turtles to conduct uh, studies. And it's also quite an expensive process. Uh, a little most basic unit of a satellite transmitter will cost anywhere between a lakh and a half uh, to two and a half lakhs needs to be procured from abroad. And uh, the data is uh, generate through the Argos network and each data point also costs, costs us. So the turtle that we tracked all the way to Mozambique and Madagascar uh, traveled for more than a year and just the cost for the data alone was uh, again more than a lakh and a half. So this has uh, kept most people away from conducting these studies and for research institutions it's not cost effective to just do it for one or two animals. Uh, we really need to conduct this over many, many animals to get a better idea. Because um, as I'd shown you with the case of the leatherbacks, if we'd just done one batch, uh, we would have thought that all the turtles go to Australia. Uh, but just because we had a larger number, we knew that uh, the turtles were going towards the Africans as well. And as is the case with most wildlife monitoring, there are several chances of uh, equipment to malfunction. It's a high invent thing. and you're literally throwing a piece of equipment back into the sea and hoping you get results. So that's probably uh, the reason why it's not taking place. Uh, yeah, it's always potential to initiate some work. Okay. Uh, second question. Uh, are all the turtle nesting beaches around river mouth? Yeah. So for the leatherbacks and olive ridleys, they're almost always found close the river mouths. Uh, they have very similar references for nesting beaches, uh, whereas the other uh, sea turtle species like the greens and oxalus, you'll find them more on island beaches uh, and on certain cases uh, like on the mainland coast, the green turtles nest only in Gujarat. Uh, so yeah, but the leatherbacks and uh, olive ridleys almost always uh, next to river mouths, highly productive areas. The beaches all have preferable slopes. So, yeah. So even if you find nesting uh, in different patches of the beaches, you find that the density of nesting is usually higher, closer to the, the river mouth. What is the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a fun question always. Uh, uh, for, if you ask me as a sea turtle biologist, I'd say that there are only sea turtles and other turtles. Uh, but uh, in more common tortoises are generally used um, as a term that is generally used for land dwelling species, uh, which are largely terrestrial. Turtles are commonly used for the animals which are more aquatic. Um, <clears throat> so sea turtles are restricted to the sea uh, and there are turtles that are freshwater dwelling as well. Uh, India has a huge variety of them. Uh, in the region. What's the longest migration ever recorded for a turtle? So it's very difficult. Uh, so these records are always uh, disputed <laughs> because one thing is we also don't know whether the transmitter has stopped because the battery has died or the turtle has died or it's fallen off. So there's only a certain 
level to which you can track these animals. And I, as far as I know, there have not been any turtles that have been successfully tracked to have gone to its foraging ground and then coming back. So okay. the long migration could potentially be the last, the, the transmitter lasted. But ex for example, the loggerhead sea turtles uh, travel all the way between the coast of Japan and uh, the coast of America. The green turtles in Ascension Island and orange uh, is in groups. So yeah, almost all species have really large long migrants. Um, so the leatherbacks, again, these are size dependent. All of the least and camps at least don't migrate far. The leatherbacks and the loggerheads are amongst the longest migrating turtles that we've had. Wonderful. If only they could talk. They could tell us so many stories. Yeah. <laughs> How to become an or intern as a budding ecologist or wildlife conservationist, marine slash ocean scientist, naturalist, being from engineering background. Here's a curveball for you. <laughs> oh, that's not a curveball at all. Some of uh, the country's greatest uh, wildlife biologists and ecologists are from different backgrounds. Uh, I don't think your uh, training really matters because, again, so let's say you're an engineer. We need a lot of tech advice from engineers as well. Uh, and we, there are enough marine biologists probably in the world, but uh, if you need to develop something to Track these animals. You need engineers over there, so sure, sure. It's good to have people based backgrounds, including arts as well. Communication, a huge thing. So uh, scientists are generally not very good communicators. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I collaborate with other people who can tell our stories better, which include uh, students from uh, the humanities as well. And again, if you're working on systems which uh, involves a lot of local communities. It's imperative to have social scientists. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, become a part. Your training your in the past doesn't matter. Uh, I think you just need to break the ice and get in touch with people uh, uh, without fear. Most of us are. Uh, we might take a little long to uh, respond, but you'll respond. Uh, so yeah, and. Uh, as I mentioned, Sea Turtles of India has a long list of uh, organizations and people working on sea turtles. Um, so you can go check them out and uh, write to them. There you go. Okay. Next question is from Jason Gracias. How do turtles eat jellyfish without getting stung? Great question. So, uh, so most uh, so leatherback especially feeds primarily on jellyfish. Uh, this is something that uh, you should Google it out to look at what a leatherback's mouth like. Uh, they have evolved, like I mentioned, from 180 million years. So they have evolved mechanisms uh, to not getting stung. Uh, their their uh, esophagus and their gut are extremely specialized uh, to be able to manage this. Uh, again, with other species, it's usually curiosity in uh, juveniles. Uh, and if you see, in most cases, they've tried to bite the jellyfish around the stingers. So that's the way it is. So is the uh, beak actually kind of uh, made of keratin like our nails? So it doesn't actually have any sensation, so it doesn't get stung? Mm. So certain species have highlight nice, like the, the Ridley's, the loggerheads, and the hawks too, especially have very strong jaws. Uh, but with lax, it has a, uh, it has an specialized specified jaw. It's almost uh, in the shape of a W. Okay. Um, that uh, also helps with uh, feeding on them. What is the role of sea turtles as keystone species in the marine ecosystem? So sea turtles are important ecosystem modifiers. Uh, uh, then they such large numbers do affect uh, uh, the habitat and ecosystems that they live in. Um, uh, this includes sea grass meadows, coral reef systems, and including uh, maintaining uh, fisheries and stuff. Uh, it's also a loaded question, uh, which I generally don't like when people ask, like, what is the role? What is 
why is it important to protect any animal because it tend to downplay its own existence like why does it have a role for it to be in the system it's been around for a long time uh, it's a very integral part of uh, culture in many cases stories mythology so i think all of these are important uh, reasons for them to be around it's about moving our way to uh, include them as part of our systems okay i'm going to skip this question from lavanya rajan which says how can i collaborate with dakshin foundation as an intern because i think you already answered that uh we move on to the next one which is what other species of sea turtles are available in india along the indian coast so you talked so about on the indian coast yeah i talked about the olive ridley and the leatherbacks right. uh so you get the little and the hawks blues as well quite commonly um the green turtles nest uh, primarily uh, in lakshadweep uh, the andaman nikobar islands at the coast of gujarat uh, but there's a large foraging population that is there in the lakshadweep group of islands uh, the hawks blues are pretty commonly seen in reef systems uh, in lakshadweep and the andaman nikobar islands but you do get miles uh, even across the west coast uh, but in large numbers so you get these four turtle species that nest the logger is not commonly seen um there has been no recent uh, record of them nesting on the in indian uh, territory but they are found in shore waters there is a large nesting ground in sri lanka so they are found in the dalnar waters there's been a recent record of the coast of maharashtra as well so yeah, so five species it's only the flatback and the kemstridley which is not found because these two are endemic uh, to the regions where they found the flatback is found only in australian waters and nests there and the kemstridley is restricted to the gulf of mexico for nesting okay so karthik gokhale says how can the conservation of coral reefs affect the turtle populations what is the relationship um so reef system provide like uh, important shelter areas for sea turtle species especially greens and hawksbills uh, apart from foraging they are protected from large predatory sharks uh, over there so yeah so reef systems a healthy reef system is also important for sea turtles that way next is an anonymous attendee and i have i'm having a serious doubt this is a vet <laughs> yeah it, it is about fibropapulomatosis so haven't been any records of it being seen uh, in indian waters um yeah so we have like the large ridley population has been in odisha which we i personally be monitoring for the last 10 years haven't seen too many occasions of uh, this occurring of the uh, papilloma virus um but there have been a few uh, rescued individuals that i have observed but it's not, doesn't seem here prevalent uh issue in this region as it is in colder waters so i'm going to act really stupid here and mm-hmm. i want to actually know what is this fibro what shall i call it <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> it's a papillomavirus which uh comes out uh in menses like a cancerous growth uh largely seen in green turtle populations first observed around uh, hawaii and other waters um so they do uh have like cancerous growth that goes across their flippers and face uh and through their uh, shells um it is a large concern for certain populations in other parts of the world but like i mentioned not uh not recorded over here in large numbers so is it fatal or they recover from uh, work has been happening over of uh, about it over a long period of time and uh, it used to be fatal but now with improved assistance and treatment uh, they have been able to recover it so uh, it's no longer such a burning issue as it used to be in the past are any internships for vets in marine conservation activities definitely there are internships for vets uh, vets are a very very important part of the entire and uh, somebody else can also get, uh, respond to this because 
uh, it has been black enough for uh, good research in the country because a lot of stuff which which we'd like to do, especially with regards to looking at reproductive biology, uh, requires trained veterinarians. Um, I think the major concern uh, that uh, most people have is that uh, since it's a protected animal, there is a large number of permits and uh, that, that you have to go through before being able to uh, conduct any work on the animal. So I think that has probably restricted uh, the kind of work that's happened in the region. Do you think that the females could choose cooler beaches for and abandon some beaches which were previously known to host nesting with the increasing global temperatures? Uh, I don't think it's an active decision making process in any of these species. Again, we're talking about evolutionary scales over here. So you're not going to look at see differences that are happening within a lifetime. I like in the last 10 years, we've seen uh, anywhere between 14 to 20,000 turtles nesting during a mass nesting event to 2 lakh turtles nesting during a mass nesting event. That doesn't mean the turtle numbers have decreased overall. It just means that certain as you have lesser nesting. Uh, but um, I don't think adapt adaptation happens at such uh, a rapid scale. But because they nest at such a wide range of places, there definitely would be cooler beaches as well. Can you tell us something about diseases and sea turtles? So again, there hasn't been much work, so which is why we need more veterinarians veterinarians to be in the in the loop. Uh, we have a fibropapilloma uh, papilloma virus is the most commonly eaten about one, and there are other conditions which include the ingestion of uh, plastics, uh, heavy metal uh, load in the body has also been a concern because nesting beaches in many cases also uh, have a lot of heavy uh, metal content to them can get directed to the bodies. Um, we have also observed, so interestingly, like uh, the anchor uh, seals also can suffer from decompression sickness. Mm, uh, they do get the there. bends. Right. So uh, this is one of the main reasons that uh, Many turtles that are caught in trawling nets tend to uh, be comatose. The decompression sickness, what happens when uh, you're diving to a certain depth and you come to the surface too quickly and nitrogen uh, bubbles uh, inside your lungs and um, other places in your blood. So when sea turtles are pulled up from the bottom of the ocean where they're feeding by nets uh, rapidly, they do go through decompression sickness as well. And it doesn't necessarily have to be fatal, as is just with humans as well. If taken care of them very much more harder than human beings, um, if taken care of, they can recover, uh, as I mentioned, because the people are scared to uh, keep the turtle on board uh, because it's a protected animal, they can get in trouble. They're usually thrown back and uh, you throw back a uh, uh, comatose turtle just drops uh, and it can't recover in the water. So this is something that we could potentially work towards in the region as well. If a turtle is injured because of any reason, what are the aspects do you look for to release them back to the ocean? <clears throat> so um, I program doesn't have any active rescue and rehab activities. There are other organizations that do that. Uh, there is a very famous uh, in Bahano, close to Mumbai, uh, where they have been carrying out a lot of uh, rescue, rehab, and uh, veterinary training as well, uh, whom you can get in touch with for that. Uh, you do need to take a look at a lot of conditions which include uh, everything that you would do for a human. You need to x-rays, MRIs. You need to assess whether they have good diving abilities, whether they're able to look. Uh, carefully, so uh, these are all the factors that you need to take into account uh, before the release animal back. Uh, in most cases, people just release them back immediately uh, because they, there is no facility that's available to test of these things, but this is definitely something that we can work towards. I had a question. One is not allowed to handle marine, uh, marine or any wild animals. 
because yeah. the forestry department actually can file a case against the vet whoever is handling this if they are not authorized to handle the animals is that yeah. correct and your yes so on. that that is correct uh, so the for the in india uh, all wildlife comes under the jurisdiction of the ministry of environment and forest and each state has their representative uh, departments uh, it is a process that everybody has been working towards and uh, the collaboration with ngos uh, by the forest departments have been good uh, they have been working with uh, these ngos in the past and they continue to do so every now and then we do hit the flags but it isn't on purpose and uh, in fact the in government and the ministry of environment and forest is going to release uh, a national plan for sea turtles very soon uh, this is something that has taken into account a lot of these details including collaborating with uh, ngo partners so that many of these could be taken into account so things will change uh, and yeah uh, it's just about continuing to uh, be patient uh, to right. get these things done so it will definitely i i see a lot of positives and i have the forest department all across the indian coast have been extremely supportive uh, right. they have undergone training they've been supporting supportive of of these ngos they've learned from all these people so it was a very new field for many of these places as well because they were trained per, primarily as terrestrial preservation uh, organizations to take care of forests as the name the it, it itself depicts so this change is happening recently and i'm sure that a lot of us in the now uh, venkat and parag and talk a lot about uh, how much this has changed over the years with the forest department collaborating with other individuals what are terrapins by karen braganza uh so terrapins is just the term that is used for freshwater turtles especially uh in the new world that is the americas so yeah terrapins are just freshwater turtles does indian government fund these projects and i'm not sure what these projects means sorry uh so there is some support from the indian government uh for many of these projects uh, the wildlife institute of which is uh, the primary institute under the wildlife environment and forest conducts ma- most of the research with government funds state governments in different places have been set aside uh, to conduct this research uh, and function activities by ngo so every state uh, forest department does their funds and for specific research grants we also apply to agencies such as the department of science and technology department of biotechnology to conduct this work in fact uh, some of the telemetry work that was conducted was also supported by isro so these are all government agencies so yes there is governmental fund funding that's available to carry out that so has there been any sightings on kemps ridley in india no kemps ridley is restricted uh, only to the gulf of mexico uh not they look not very even a similar. tourist coming here right not even a tourist <laughs> okay. uh, as i mentioned small animals they don't travel as far as the leatherback so it's a little far from mexico all the way to the indian coast so right they have been seen in this region is there a particular reason that these beaches are nesting grounds what attracts turtles to those beaches and why do different species prefer different locations so if you remember the graphic that i showed the changing beach that's actually one very important factor that we consider uh imagine a static beach which is going to remain the same and uh, 100000 bund lakh to lakh turtles nest over there uh and the hatching submerge there's a lot of uh biotest including the egg shells and everything so that can cause actions um so by being close to these river mouths uh, it also ensures that with the annual monsoons and flooding that takes place which is get washed away and fresh sand is deposited so they kind of get refreshed uh different species use different beaches based on again habitat patterns uh hawksbills and greens being largely specific to reef systems uh find their important nesting grounds very close to uh foraging areas as well um whereas the leatherbacks and uh olive ridleys are more generalists but uh, the olive ridleys are just more in numbers than uh, the leatherbacks the leatherbacks are largely restricted to oceanic 
wide nesting beaches and with minimal uh, as you increase uh, urbanization and development in certain regions do tend to get avoided by most turtle species. Uh, so the olive ridley is quite tolerant. In India, they have been known to nest on metropolitan city coast like Chennai city, uh, including the Marina Beach. Uh, in Goa, they are nesting uh, heavy touristy beaches, including uh, Agonda and Morgin uh, and other places as well. So, yeah, species are a lot more gentle than other ones, but uh, the most specific ones are restricted because of habitat. And is the hawksbill, which is supposed to be the most endangered one among all the turtles, is that correct? So the Kemp's Ridley and the hawksbill are considered to be under great threat, largely. The Kemp's Ridley, because it saw a massive population decline uh, up to the 70s uh, due to both uh, paid adults and eggs, uh, there's been a, a concentrated like recovery program that's been taking place in those regions. And the hawksbills uh, were an important part of it because their shells uh, are very beautiful and that's what is used for making tortoise shell um, artifacts, uh, which include homes and jewelry. So their shells are traded. So the hawksbills are heavily in wildlife trade. Uh, all the other sea turtle species are largely consumed only for meat, uh, but uh, there is an additional uh, value associated to the shell for hawksbills. Uh, Hence, they're still uh, classified under critically endangered um, uh, because of the trade uh, that's involved in that. So the tortoise shell, how is the sale in India? Has it been banned or anything? All, all, all wildlife products from sea turtles are banned because all sea turtle species come under Schedule 1. Um, uh, si most of the sea turtle species are also listed in the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, ITs. So there is no international trade that can be done with these species. Um, but there are certain regions, including certain parts of Japan, uh, where, again, a lot of this, it's a tricky question. Like, we don't need to protect everything. There are certain things that are culturally significant as well, which includes the industry which makes uh, tortoise shell artifacts. Uh, now what's done is in many cases uh, in Japan, especially they look at only seized animals or dead animals, which uh, are very strictly licensed and goes through a very strict patrolled list of uh, certified artisans who can make these artifacts. So that issue still continues because again, it would be a huge loss in terms of uh, art, culture, and tradition to lose out on certain those sets as well. Uh, because the relationships that, again, these artisans and those animals have was in a commercial venture, a global commercial. It was a very uh, a small scale industry. OK, KM has a question. I had an, a chance to visit a turtle hatchery in Sri Lanka. Seemed very underwhelming. Seems less of a scientific organization, more of a tourist exhibition job. How are these in India? Have tourist traffic reached there yet? Uh, so we don't have any hatcheries very similar to what you would have seen in coast uh, of Sri Lanka. Um, see, again, this industry, there is a demand. Um, if done sustainably, there are best practices that can be. Uh, because uh, even in cases of sea turtle nesting, because they come out at night, and on beaches, nobody knows where they've nested and if they're protected, there is no interaction with these animals at all. So nobody what a turtle looks like, unless you're a diver or a researcher who likes to spend time working on beaches at night to look for animals. Uh, so these uh, series are great in um, increasing awareness for a lot of people who may not have that kind of access to these systems. Uh, so there are good ways to do it and managed well. I'm sure it can only have positive effects, uh, but there are bad ways to do it where it's exploitative. Uh, they're not managed properly. They're not fed properly, uh, kept in small tanks. Obviously those are bad things. So it's a, 
the topic is uh, it's uh, it's heavily debated amongst the community of people who work on sea turtle cell uh, there is a group of people who just don't want to any interactions nobody should touch see uh, uh, stay away from sea turtles there but there are a group of us who think that because of this loss of interaction most urban communities have is why there's no connect that these people have with the environment itself so i think that uh, we should just look forward to uh, different ways to do this sustainably and manage it well so instead of completely avoiding things we can come up with good ideas do hawksbill turtles feeding on marine sponges have a significant impact in controlling the sponge growth curve they do uh, which is why hawksbills and green turtles both are uh, very commonly known as ecosystem engineers um the green turtle in lakshadweep the story is now that the numbers have increased so much uh that they overgrazing the sea grass meadows and uh, because of that it's having secondary effects on uh juvenile fishes in the water and other uh species are dependent on the sea grass so again a loss of uh, large marine threats such as sharks due to extensive fishing has caused a boom in population in certain cases and has led to negative impacts but uh in would imagine as a perfect system uh in their uh, in regulated numbers they manage those issues by removing excess sponge numbers in that is that only hawksbill turtles that feed on sponges you also said greens feed on them right uh also is there any omnivorous turtles or just herbivorous and carnivorous uh yeah birds primarily feed on sponges they are specialists on sponges adult green turtles are primarily herbivorous they specialize on foraging on sea grass and algae uh they do sometimes consume uh, sponges during the pest uh they all live really generally you would you could call them omnivorous because they would feed on everything um uh so i wouldn't call them entirely carnivorous but uh, they won't be feeding on too much plant matter the leatherback again is specialist which feeds primarily on fish so each different species depending on the habitats have a uh, different uh, food habits as you had mentioned most of your work is done during the period when the turtles are on land is there any work done with turtles when they are in the open water apart from the global tracking activities that would require diving <laughs> yes um yeah there is work that's being conducted uh, in many places so uh, sea turtles many sea turtles also can be uniquely identified by their facial patterns uh so there are resident animals that have been photographed over many years uh and their behavior is studied on the water uh but uh, this is restricted to a small area in where we can find them in large abundances um uh, we carry out uh, surveys on boats largely to look at offshore distributions um so there isn't much in water work and again uh, many of these species have an oceanic life that's the period where you really can't track them with anything except uh, satellite telemetry and uh, unless they are relaxed uh, in water as most divers would have seen if they want to swim away there's no way any diver can keep up with them sipadan island in malaysia where there are these massive yeah. green turtles i don't know whether they are actually resident in that area or whether they also migrate would you know something about that in many cases they have especially with the green turtle and hawks bulls again their habitat uh, the larger individuals in many cases don't necessarily migrate there have, have been cases where there are two resident animals which orange uh, and it will be in a certain in the same place but very very rare cases almost all sea turtles like i mentioned have a distinct reproductive phase and a foraging phase during a uh, life cycle so they forage in certain areas but they go back to nest uh, to their natal nesting grounds where they were born 
So yeah, almost all sea turtle species, they might take longer. So uh, I mentioned that the olive red leaf can nest once in two years. But, uh, the larger species like greens and leatherbacks can take up to seven to eight years before they can go back because again, diet is an important feature over here. Uh, olive red leaves being uh, omnivorous, and they do consume a lot of calcium in their diet. Whereas green turtles uh, being herbivores and leatherbacks feeding largely on jellyfish need a longer time to accumulate calcium in their bodies so that they can lay their eggs. So yeah, so they may seem resident because they've been around for about six to eight in a region, but uh, well, they have to nest in my great time. The thing was because I was staying on the island in 1989 mm. and we were only 16 divers and we were diving every day, three or four dives a day. And at night, one of the turtles actually came up and laid its eggs right under our A-frame hut. Mm. So, you know, it was a bit difficult to tell whether it, it had come from far away or whether it was living in the area. Just decided to come and yeah, so which is why you need to tag the individuals because they can know for sure That's uh, right. yeah. which animal has come. So the satellite tag is the expensive part, but I'd also show you the flipper tagging, which is the simplest and cost most cost effective way of tracking these animals. But the caveat over here is again there is a question about how long sea turtles live with segment right now. Mm -hmm. Sea turtles can live up to sixty to eighty years, uh, uh, depending on the species and the activities that they've gone through. Uh, so you really need to track these animals for a really long period of time before uh, we can find out much information. The leatherbacks that we started tagging in 2010, uh, we kept tagging every individual that we came across. It took us eight years before we got an individual that had come back to nest. So something that we tagged in 2010 came back to nest only in 2018. Uh, and only because we tagged them, were we able to know that it was the same turtle? Otherwise, there's no way of uh, figuring out how these things happen. So, yeah, sea turtles, unlike their terrestrial counterparts, are expected to have a span about uh, 60 to 80 years, uh, probably 100 in their uh, cases. But yeah, because they do have a lot more active lifespan, because as I mentioned, they migrate, they swim across long distances. So, uh, they don't have a slowdown phase like most terrestrial species. Is there any particular reason why the turtles come to the same coast to lay eggs where they were born? This is largely again to do with their cyclical view, like life, life cycle that they have. They move between their foraging areas and their nesting areas using a combination of factors such as the ocean currents which are moving in that particular direction. They're not actively swimming for most parts. They actually use the current to uh, move along the way. And if anybody remembers Finding Nemo, they talk about the East Australian current, if I'm not wrong, uh, which the green turtles use to migrate point to point faster. So these are factors which make them reach from point to point, but they all use the Earth's magnetic pull uh, to get them in, uh, in a certain region. Um, so in most cases, why they're going back to the same nesting beaches is potentially because if they've hatched and survived through their growth phase in becomes, uh, that is most likely a very productive nesting ground. Uh, and it's, which is why you find preferred nesting beaches. So which they, they tend to hone back into those areas necessarily have to be that specific stretch of beach. Uh, we have observed right. the same sea turtle in, in the Kahirmata uh, and nest in the Brushapili as well, which are about 300, 350 kilometers apart. So broadly around the same region, but they can nest in different areas, but they're yeah. zooming in on areas which have productive nesting grounds. Thank you so much, Murli. It's been fascinating. Thank I've learned a lot. Uh, Appreciate even with the all the internet snags. <laughs> Yeah, well, part of life, right? But it was very informative, yeah. and I'm sure everybody learned a lot and enjoyed the whole situation, the uh, session. Right now, we've got various webinars coming on. This is basically being done just as a part of an education campaign that we are running. We are so grateful to SSI for actually giving us this platform to run this series of webinars, which is coming up 
and also we are going to add to that even more so they have been very kind to give us this uh, in view of the fact that we are doing this for conservation purposes so please note all the webinars which are coming up which are also mostly on dates which are important in the environmental calendar so 21st june international climate change day we are getting an expert from pune called sunith who is coming to talk about solar energy and then on 28th we have alternate energy forms by jairam who's uh, come joining us from digital energy from california on 4th of july we have a talk on newdi brands and sea slugs by dr deepak apte who is the director of bnhs from bombay this would be very interesting i've seen his photographs and he has just published a book it is a fabulous book so please join us for that 14th july is shark awareness day and we have one of uh, our friends and uh, persons who helped me on one of the shark uh, research programs called uh, finprint global finprint uh one she kasana she is studying sharks and rays in the us right now on 30th of august we've got international whale shark day and a fabulous photo talk by digan uh, desai who also happens to be my partner in our uh, travel company called scuba centric where we do live travel okay so all the comp completed webinars will be uploaded on youtube and uh, links will be shared on our website coastalimpact.in as well as on the whatsapp group at coastal impact and facebook at coastal impact once again thank you so much murli for joining us really appreciate your time and effort and also thank you so much thank you <laughs> thank you so much and siddharth neha jugal from the ssi team who have been so kind to give us this time and this space so our pleasure venkat thank you so much i hope uh, we'll see you guys back again here on the 21st i believe for the next one good night guys see you guys good night thank you good night <laughs>